Yeah, it's a real uh, privilege and honor to to come before you today. I, I was I was looking at some of the attendees list and seeing many familiar uh, names and faces. So it's it's great to have uh, those of you uh, uh, joining and, and others who I, who I don't know. My name is Art Trembanis. Uh, I'm a professor of oceanography and geology here at the University of Delaware, where I've been since uh, uh, 2005. Um, and I run a, a AUV autonomous systems, just or just be AUV, but autonomous systems uh, lab for for mapping coastal uh, areas uh, to the to the shelf edge. And and this is really largely a how I spent my summer vacation talk. Um, and uh, um, from a couple of years ago, in fact, uh, I, I was reminded today uh, a year ago today was the premiere. Of uh, of the episode of Drain the Oceans that uh, that this this project and this work was a part of. So if you if you get uh, uh, Disney Plus um, and the National Geographic Channel, uh, it's a really great series. I mean, I think it's a series that is perfectly suited for this audience. It is a it's a series in which uh, hydrography and seafloor mapping plays center stage in in a very uh, uh, in a very important way. And so. Um, we were fans of the series before we were asked to be in, involved. Um, and uh, a little over two and a half years ago, I guess I was asked by uh, uh, Jim Delgado if I'd be interested in, in uh, participating and helping lead an expedition to go map Bikini Atoll. And I don't think that, that Jim even finished his sentence before I said, uh, absolutely. Um, and this work really represents uh, a, a large, you know, collaborative effort. Um, uh, from from Jim, who quite literally wrote the book on on the uh, activities there, he wasn't able to join us for the expedition. Dr. Mike Brennan, who some of you may know, um, who's also at Search, uh, Carter Duval, who is a former PhD student of mine, who's now a postdoc down at NRL, and uh, uh, a, a then undergraduate student Grant Otto, uh, uh, who, who came out with me. So I thought I'd give you a you know kind of a, a little bit about this and some of the things that you might not see on that episode but it really does a, a fantastic treatment of it so uh if, if you if you like this and other topics i highly recommend that you check out uh, uh that series uh we were involved in another episode the previous uh year about new york and the uss san diego shipwreck uh, and we've got one coming out sometime later this spring or summer about uh hurricane uh, uh superstorm sandy but uh, i'll tell you a bit about uh, bikini now now this is this is what bikini looks like in my mind. You know, this is the bikini that that I picture. This was a photo I took uh, from a drone that we put uh, that we brought with us up at about 300 feet, pointing towards the the western uh, end of the of, of the atoll. Um, and so, you know, in many ways, this is this is this is a, a truism. This is what what bikini is. But uh, if you go back a generation, if I say bikini, well, for for People my kid's age, Bikini is, well, that's where SpongeBob, you know, lives, right? That's, that's, you know, he lives at Bikini Bottom. Or, um, you know, fans of, uh, of uh, 50s, 60s uh, pop pop music, Brian Howland's Itsy Bitsy Teeny Weeny Yellow Polka Dot Bikini. Or if, or if like me, you're a fan of the, uh, the uh, Godzilla franchise. In fact, the origin story of Godzilla is tied to, to, to nuclear testing. And, uh, was in many ways a um, a reflection of and a way in which Japanese culture was wrestling with the legacy of the bombs that had been dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. By the way, this this image in the background is one we will return to because that is actually from uh, from from Bikini. But if we go we continue working back in time, so I started at Bikini today, and we're working back in time. Bikini in 1954 was the site of the largest, still the largest hydrogen bomb test that the U.S. ever conducted a 15 megaton bomb known as Castle Bravo uh, that exceeded uh, the yield uh, uh, expectations uh, by more than twofold and, and unleashed a, a, a terrible uh, outfall uh, onto um, uh, Bikinians and other Marshallese more than 100 miles away and, and onto an unsuspecting uh, Japanese fishing boat in, in the area. And um, if we go back to uh, 1946, almost it'll be 75 years this July. Um, but this was this was the reality of Bikini on July 25th of 1946, when the world's first underwater nuclear bomb uh, was detonated, an atomic bomb known as the uh, Baker. It was actually known as Helen of Bikini, and was then the one, two, three, four, fifth uh, a fifth atomic bomb 
uh, that was uh, ever de detonated, part of the operations crossroad uh, test, which we were there to, to come and sort of document. And of course, all of this is an outgrowth of, of the history of the atomic bomb program and, and Oppenheimer's uh, leadership of the Manhattan Project and the, and the test and, and detonation, um, uh, the Trinity explosion uh, in Alamogordo, New Mexico, out, out in the desert. You know, that, uh, that test uh, and the subsequent uh, dropping of, of the, the bomb uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki were, uh, were done under, uh, you know, the cloak and to the extent that they could, you know, the, largely the sort of the, the secrecy of, uh, of the war. And it certainly brought a, a hastened end to the war in the Pacific uh, at, a, at a terrible uh, human uh, toll. But, um, but there was still a lot that wasn't known uh, and still a lot that the, the, the War Department, Defense Department and, and the uh, various branches of the Defense Department wanted to sort of work out. And so that uh, is in many ways what set the stage for um, um, the events that took place in Bikini Atoll uh, and throughout the Marshall Islands from 1946 to 1958. In 1946, the U.S. Uh, came to, forces came to Bikini and asked the 160 some odd Bikinians who were living there if they could borrow these islands for the good of mankind, as it was put in, in those in, in, in that time. And uh, and the Bikinians agreed to it um, and have not been home since. I mean, there was a brief period in the 70s where they tried to come back, but the radiation levels were still too high. So. I think uh, it's important that we remember in the um, in the context of all of this and the history of all of this is that um, this testing program set into play the first uh, you know nuclear nomads uh, and and refugees and 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 that that uh, legacy that even though the testing stopped um, the impacts of it uh, still continue uh, to 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 this day um, and uh, affected not only the the Marshallese and the Bikinians. But also, as as I'll show you in a moment, um, you know, uh, an, another another set of uh, a population that was affected by this. Um, and so, what they designed was an absolutely uh, you know epic uh, experiment. Now, now I, I knew about I knew you know vaguely about the testing of bikini, and I knew that actually a lot of science had been done there. Uh, I was aware that in fact many many uh, of the uh, titans of 20th century oceanography uh, had gone out and conducted some of the, the studies at, uh, before and after the testing of Bikini. Walter Monk, uh, who, who I, I had the privilege of meeting a few, a few years ago, had gone out there and set out uh, some, some instruments. Teo Emery uh, and, 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 and others had been part of, uh, you know, there, so it wasn't just, there wasn't just military activities going on, but there was a whole slew of, of scientific investigations that, that had gone on as there had done uh, during during the war. Operations Crossroads though was was a it was a unique undertaking because it was uh, establishing a a, uh, a a nuclear battlefield and and the questions were you had the the nascent uh, Air Force grew out of the Army Air Corps the Army saying well there's really no no more need for for navies we've got nuclear weapons and and then you had the Navy saying, well, we're not quite sure about that. So they wanted to see what would happen, what would be the effect of unleashing, you know, atomic bombs on, on, uh, on the naval forces. So they actually designed uh, a three-stage testing, uh, Abel, Baker, and Charlie. They never completed the Charlie test. Um, Abel was to be an air, air dropped, air detonation, uh, Baker, uh, a water detonation and shallow in the lagoon. And then Charlie was meant to be a deep water test. And they they amassed uh, more than 95, about 100 ships in the in this area, of uh, various sizes, battleships, uh, aircraft carriers, light and 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 heavy aircraft carriers, attack transporters, uh, transport ships, uh, and not just U.S. ships. They had uh, German ships, uh, and the Prince Eugen was there, and Japanese ships, including the the Sakawa and the Nagato. The Nagato was uh, very symbolically brought out since it was. Yamamoto's uh, um, command ship for carrying out the attack on Pearl Harbor. So it was it was very much a you know going to put a final period in coda to the end of uh, of, of of the war. Um, Admiral Blandy shown here on the left with his wife and this um, mushroom cloud cake um, was uh, uh, spearheaded the effort 
And again, you know, I think I think in in many ways, from a logistics standpoint, from from a scale of the investigation and the 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 um, testing that went on, it is it's 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 very truly impressive. I mean, all the number of ships, all the arrays, the instrumentation that was brought out, fully fifty percent. And the and the, the documentary this was a, a a point we knew going into this, but the documentary brings it up. Uh, fully fifty percent of all the film that was available on planet Earth in 1946 was brought to Bikini to document what was going on here. High speed film, aerial footage, cameras on the ground, mounted on on you know uh, on, on different structures, you know uh, instruments placed on the ships to measure temperatures and pressures. It was really quite an impressive uh, undertaking. Um, and at a time when I think it's pretty safe to say, and this this picture on the left captures it, there was a an early days sort of love affair with the bomb, you know, in ways that in hindsight uh, are, seem you know a little bit. Uh, more than a little bit gauche, you know, just seemed seem a little, uh, you know, didn't, didn't quite read the read, read the room, but uh, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't taken lightly in terms of how it was how it was carried out, I, I would say, and it was done because it was meant to be this sort of cake cutting ceremony. It was meant to be a a the the you know the the ball the the coming out party for the bomb, whereas the other testing had been done in secrecy. This was done with the world's eyes and attention on stage. They wanted to document it. They wanted to show the power and might of it. And uh, they brought uh, a number of different ships. They also brought uh, animals out, pigs, goats, uh, uh, rodents, others to see what would happen when exposed uh, to the bombs. One pig actually uh, famously got thrown overboard, survived the bombing, was brought back to, to DC. And I think, uh, I think you know, lived out its days at the, at, at the zoo there for, for many years. Um, can't remember the name of that, that pig, but. But um, the other group that was was very much impacted by this were the were the sailors and the, and the military personnel, mostly men, but there were also some women, nurses, and, and others that, that were there who were brought out to the Marshall Islands, brought out to Bikini to help prep uh, the 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 site, prep the instrumentation, prep the ships, and then uh, also many of them were, were were asked to to go out afterwards when they thought, well, they'll just be able to wash off these ships and clean them, scrub them down, and and then be able to reuse them or turn them into into scrap. And unfortunately, sadly, that um, led to some high exposures for, uh, for for many of them and a whole you know generation uh, uh, of folks who who suffered uh, uh, longer uh, and in some cases debilitating or, or life-ending injuries uh, because of their radiation exposure afterwards. Um, so um, quickly, I just say, well, why why did they end up at at, at bikini? Um, um, it wasn't known, you know, the the the, uh, the the bathing suit wasn't invented till afterwards as a reflection on, on this. Well, it had it had a number of things going for it. It was remote. It had a large lagoon. It was within a few miles of Kwajalein. And while it wasn't um, unpopulated, it had a relatively a small a small population. But it had had it did have a a, a population uh, there. Um, and it is a far way away. I, this was definitely the most remote location that. Uh, I never had to to try to conduct a, an expedition. I think in my mind, I kind of had this vision that you know, you know, uh, islands in the Pacific they must be tiny little things. But just for scale, uh, I've sort of overlaid here over um, uh, the southern part of Delaware the size of the Bikini Atoll. So it's it's huge. It's more than 30 miles across from end end to end. The individual islands themselves are fairly small, as they represent that sort of upper uh, lip, upper frosting rim around these uh, seamounts that dot throughout this part of the uh, of the Pacific. And so our goal was pretty simple: we were being tasked to try to come in and, and conduct the first comprehensive geoacoustic geophysical survey uh, of of the area um, to try to really get a sense of the uh, layout and the conditions. Uh, at the operations crossroads sites, and if we had time for the areas used for the Castle Bravo tests for the Castle series, um, and um, and that's 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 what we set out to do. Um, it took us took us six days to get there from the time we left Delaware, and and uh, the sixty hours were uh, of were just uh, making the uh, the uh, cruise from Majuro uh, out to Bikini. And once we left Majuro, the next time we saw land was 60 hours later when we saw Bikini. We didn't see a single plane, no contrails, no other no other ship passing by. And so, it, you know, for, for me, it very much brought it quickly, uh, uh, made it quickly apparent how remote, uh, how remote this area, uh, this area was. And we worked with 
uh, one of only a, a couple of ships that actually has established and runs trips uh, to there. We worked off of the Indy Surveyor group that actually typically runs dive charters out to there. It has been um, a, you know, kind of a epic bucket list place for, for, for divers because there are so many ships uh, uh, gathered there. Um, but, you know, we had a number, you know, of course, as soon as you, once it goes from being inv in, invited to then having to map, as many of you in this in this call can attest to, you, you know, your mind starts turning into logistics and operations. Okay, I'm going to have to try to, you know, wide area map it. Well, what sort of resolution? What sort of uh, characters? What data products do I need to get? And then, and then what observations and, and uh, resources do I have to, to get that, uh, get that dog? Excuse my, my dog there. He's, he's very excited about it. Um, and so, um, for for us, that wide area map, we wanted to be able, we needed to be of sufficient resolution to establish a condition of the wrecks, and we wanted to be able to compare back to the last, the, the previous time that they had really been investigated, uh, which was in 1989 and 1990 when the National Park Service had been the first group to go in, uh, aside from the Navy, had been the first group to go in and try to do a uh, a systematic assessment of it. And they had done that with with some uh, some diving, and we had some severe restrictions. We we they didn't have the full resources and 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 time. And oh, by the way, um, we're going to shoot an we're going to shoot a, a a production while you're there. It's not just like hey, do your mapping. You're going to have cameras and film crew are going to eat up half of half of all the berths on on the ship. So we had to we had to have equipment that we could readily deploy. Uh, from vessels that we wouldn't have seen, we weren't going to see until we arrived, um, and uh, everything needed to be able to quickly air pallet and ship to get to Madro and then load on a plane. Now, of course, in, in my group, we're 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 privileged to have a whole variety of different resources, uh, autonomous and and and, uh, and 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 not, but for on the air, on the surface, and and underwater. And so, in, in my mind, if I had my druthers, of course, I'd bring. A whole SWAT team of uh, friends and colleagues and students and and all of the all of the gear and, and toys and gear that that we have in our arsenal, but that wasn't uh, to to be. So so instead we were we were we were limited operationally. We needed something with small form factors and and uh, um, you know so couldn't bring a big a AUV or a big ROV. And so um, we brought um, instead uh, stuff everything we could pack into a, a little air freight uh, D container, and that included a um, uh, those those items that, that that you see here, knowing also that there was no local tide station, there was no local cores reference station. We were going to have to bring everything that we could uh, have, and uh, so we we uh, you know called out a lot of uh, favors and, and help from from folks in the uh, in the industry and other academic groups, and we had great help and support from the folks at uh, uh, Ping DSP and Chesapeake Technology and and QPS and Coda and. And, and many others, and we ended up bringing our ping DSP, which is a phase measuring bathy sonar, it operates at 450 kilohertz, nice small form factor, uh, paired with a Coda F190 uh, remote head uh, sonar, and um, uh, INS rather, and, and, and this is all we had to go on. We had a picture of an 18 foot aluminum tender, and uh, we had seven images, and, and uh, Grant, who's an engineer, had to try to come up with, you know, mounts after some sort of you know, quick drawings. We needed to kind of come up with something that we could that we could do to to mount this uh, system. So it was a uh, and an exposed, generally pretty exposed boat. Um, and uh, we had to load everything, ship it, hope that it would get there. We had to separately carry redundancies with us, so we air carried a, a whole separate set. Luckily, everything arrived. We we staged everything, tested it out in Majuro, and then had to tear everything apart again for the transit. Um, and as as many of you know, I mean, once you've once you've mobilized your gear, you want to start running lines, and you don't want to have to mess with it again. But we had to, we had to get out there. Of course, there was no tide station, so we used our aquadop and we dove down to the top of uh, the Saratoga USS Saratoga and set that to record, you know, pressure uh, over the period so that we could at least uh, reference things to uh, uh, to a, a mean sea level uh, while we were while we were there. We weren't trying to establish hydrographic charts per se. We just wanted to get an internally consistent high resolution uh, map of the site. And and we all, uh, by the way, we only had eight days on station to be able to do do all of this, to map an area about one and a half times the size of Central Park. Uh, this is the resulting uh, map area of it. Uh, I actually have a have a 3D uh, print of it here uh, that uh, that I that I that I've made and, and brought brought out. There's about 20 million sounding points in, in here. This is gridded at a, a 
I believe a one meter grid on this. Um, and um, it's uh, there's a lot going on here. Um, there are 12 ships uh, in this in this scene right here. Uh, 12 that, that are still on the seabed of the 95 or so that were there for the testing of a, a whole variety of different types. There's two submarines in here. There's the uh, aircraft carrier. There's battleships, uh, attack transporters, um, you know, just, uh, just, you know, all in that, you know, one little area. So it, it is in many ways kind of like this underwater Disneyland for, for, for ships. And they're smack dab in the middle, and it doesn't take much uh, to, to, to recognize, is in fact the remains of the Baker Crater. And that, first and foremost, was one of the, one of the uh, amazing uh, discoveries that we had, that it was still there. I mean, it speaks to the fact that it's still a very benign, a generally pretty benign uh, uh, seabed uh, in, in the lagoon. That's pretty calm and protected. But here, at that time, 73, this year it'll be 75 years later, the the physical remains of that crater still exist. There's very little new sediment that's produced here, and at these depths, uh, ambient seabed outside is about 50 meters deep, and you can see it's about a 10 meter deep uh, uh, crater there from a profile uh, across uh, across there. There's also quite a number of it's, it's quite a complicated seabed in this lagoon, as many atoll lagoons are, where there are natural coral mounds. Some uh, that come near to the surface. In fact, some of these were such an obstacle or perceived to have been an obstacle that as they were prepping the area for the test, uh, U.S. forces dynamited uh, some of these, uh, um, you know, I mean, when you, when you think of some of the efforts that went into doing this, I mean, there's no way you could get permitting to do or even conceive of doing permitting for, for a project like this. Well, we're going to prep an area where we're going we're gonna to dynamite some coral to, to clear the area so we can get the ships in and, and we're probably going to leave them there. And then, well, we're going to set off some some nuclear bombs. So um, Baker Crater, 800 meters diameter, 10 meters relief, and that's just the portion that hasn't fully filled in. Um, as we look deeper at the data, uh, and by the way, we were getting our butts absolutely beaten up in this little 18 foot aluminum boat uh, because it was a June. Uh, it was still a uh, windy part of the year with uh, trade winds. So we'd have favorable wind lines and then we'd turn and then just go right into, you know, beating into four foot, four foot waves. So it's a real testament to, to the gear and, and, the, and the folks that we managed to, to get, get the data we wanted together. Um, as we started looking at some of the, the, the bathymetry data and looking at some of the uh, surface morphology derivatives, I, I couldn't help but look at a, a slope plot and, and there noticed that there was some clearly coherent structures centered around and emanating from the Baker Crater. And uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't appear, it doesn't come into play in the documentary, which is really focused on the shipwrecks and the atomic bomb testing. But still, and for anybody who's interested in, in, in talking more or helping us understand these more, what we discovered was there are bed forms, the, the first occurrence of atomic bomb bed forms on, on, on the seafloor um, that were, were generated by the forces unleashed uh, by, the, by, the Baker, uh, by the Baker blast. Um, and we could see these are both able and the Baker test were 21 kiloton atomic fission bombs, but you can see radiating away this sort of rose petal or cauliflower type uh, radiation of, of bed forms uh, moving away from that uh, Baker crater. They have wavelengths of between 30 to 75 meters and amplitudes of about one, one to two meters. Unfortunately, we saw these, you know, uh, as a geomorphologist, my, I started drooling and I would have loved to have spent the rest of the expedition just exploring those. Of course, we didn't have our sub bottom with us. We didn't have any coring gear you know, and we had to sort of, you know, uh, focus on the other stuff we were doing. Here's a profile right next to the USS pilot fish, uh, which is a Bilal class uh, submarine. If you want to see a, a, a submarine like the pilot fish, go to uh, Pearl Harbor. You can visit uh, one of the sister ships uh, uh, there. That's lying on the seabed. It was in the middle of the water column. It was suspended in the middle of the water column. When the blast went off, the pilot fish got squeezed by the, the, the pressure, uh, heat and the pressure and, 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 and sunk. And here you can see those sort of climbing bed forms that radiate away from, uh, from the center of the, uh, of the crater. They're in some ways not unlike uh, volcanic bed forms. Uh, or analogous to some turbidity flow bed forms, although in both of those cases, those would be bed forms flowing downhill, uh, whereas some of this may have been generated on the upflow or the return flow part. It's not, it's not entirely clear. Okay, so 
I want to mention some of the ships here because, of course, this is a this is a graveyard of of some some pretty interesting shipwrecks, including uh, the USS Gilliam, which was has the distinction of being the first ship sunk by an atomic weapon, and, and it was done in by the Able Blast, uh, un, unanticipatedly. Uh, it was not meant to be the ground zero target. Rather, the ground zero target for the Able test was meant to be this ship uh, that I'm holding in my hands, the USS Nevada, which was painted bright orange, the color of the Golden Gate Bridge for the test. Unfortunately, as is the case with dropping a, a fairly bulky, uh, not terrifically hydro aerodynamic bomb from uh, from up in the air, uh, as the as the uh, uh, able bomb um, uh, dropped, it uh, um, it fell off target and detonated right over uh, the the Gilliam, which is an attack transporter, and uh, and and Im and immediately you know vaporized and and. Uh, and, and plunged it to, to the to the seabed. It now sort of lies in this sort of drooping uh, wreck uh, right around one of the natural coral um, mound uh, rims. So the, each of the coral mounds tends to have a, a little uh, halo of a moat around it. And it's, uh, it's, the, it's the strangest thing because they, the wreck has folds of steel. It looks like a, best description I have is it kind of looks like a melted chocolate bar or a you know, a, a fondant cake that's been left out in the in the sun, and the divers came back and they'd never seen you know sort of anything anything like it. The way that the forces that you know pushed down the extreme temperature and pressure that was unleashed uh, on this uh, on this ship, um, and they used this data. They used the data that we have for that to uh, to uh, illustrate what happened for, for, to the Gilliam in the uh, uh, in the documentary. Uh, another one of the ships that's focused on, uh, of course, is probably the most, what, probably one of, if not the most famous ship in, in the lagoon, um, is the USS Saratoga uh, CV-3 that had come through the war, had come through kamikaze attacks and, and torpedo attacks, still has the record for more aircraft took off of the deck of that aircraft carrier than any other ship in history. Um, and they brought it out. Um, with uh, planes and uh, tanks and uh, other things on its deck uh, to see what would happen. It survived the ABLE test and they repositioned it and then it was, uh, it was, it was damaged and sunk from the, uh, from the Baker test. This, she sits now bolt upright on, on the seabed, sea uh, eight inch deck guns you know, pointing up to the sky. Here on the lower right, you can see uh, one, of our, uh, one of our divers and behind him to the right, is one of these where they were known as Christmas trees. It was one of the instrumentation areas that, that had all sorts of instruments on it uh, still on the deck. Um, now the folks from Park Service, uh, we, we got real excited when we were, we, we did a lot of passes back and forth. It's certainly it's the largest individual wreck thing I've ever mapped. It just felt like as we were pinging across it, like it took forever. It just just, just kept, kept going and going. It's a uh, uh, the Saratoga is uh, a little bit longer than the Titanic, so you know it's an absolutely massive ship, um, and um, you can still see uh, some of the items on, on the deck, the, the deck elevator, and you know massive collapse uh, going on in the in the back uh, back of the deck. In fact, much more so even than what had been uh, documented in the early, late 80s and early 90s. So we're seeing subsequent you know decay. Uh, of of this uh, of this and, and other wrecks uh, here. The Saratoga, by the way, is also leaking uh, bunker fuel. We could smell it. We knew we were over it as we were we were mapping. Um, as is the the Nagato. So unlike World War One era wrecks, which were were coal uh, driven, you know our World War Two era ships uh, around the world are reaching a point, many of them, where they are coming apart and like terrible pinatas releasing things on them. And by the way, these ships were prepped with, this wasn't like they were prepping an artificial reef where you pull everything out and you make it as pristine. They had varying levels of fuel. That was a variable that they tested. Various levels of munitions were on board. So there are there are dummy and live fire weapons on this and, and other uh, ships uh, uh, through, throughout here. Um, the visibility, it's some of the most amazing diving uh, I've ever had a chance to do. You can see the collapse in the deck. Um, which is a hazard also for the divers. Um, and uh, I want to show you another one. I mentioned the pilot fish. Um, the divers were able to, we, we would do our wide area surveys 
Uh, the Sakawa, which we which we found, hadn't been found by the National Park Service. The Sakawa is an interesting one in that it was sunk by the Able test and then further pummeled by Baker. It's within the outer portion of the the Baker crater. Uh, Pilot fish is 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 right in there as well. And as I mentioned, it was sort of it was sort of shrunk shrunk wrapped. Um, if you look at uh, if you go to Pearl and you visit the USS Balfin, you can see the 18 inch torpedo tubes and notice there on the lower left the the separation between those. On the lower right, as we were out at Bikini, we were viewing some diver footage. I asked one of the divers, I said, what are we looking at? He said, oh, I took a photo of the, the, the torpedo tubes. And here you can see the two torpedo tubes are actually butt up against each other kissing. So that that's, tells you about the, you know, the, the, the level of, of crushing, you know, power that, that went on um, from, from the uh, force of the, uh, the bomb. So those are just a few of the, the highlights from, from the Operations Crossroads area. We managed to finish that area, and we were, were really eager to try to get to the western end of the island, where this bomb was released in, in uh, February of 1954, uh, the Castle uh, Bravo, a hydrogen bomb, and again, the largest one that we ever uh, detonated. It actually um, wiped out three islands uh, from, the, from the map. So, so talk about terraforming and, and really rewriting you know the, the 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 charts, and you can see that today if you zoom in from satellite view. You know we kind of knew something strange was going on on the western of the island. And if you look at a few other little spots, you can see little cookie cutter areas around the atoll. There were 23 uh, nuclear bombs detonated in Bikini between 1946 and 1958. Um, you know the the two I mentioned just previously were these ones here uh, in the eastern part of the the, the lagoon where Abel and Baker were tested. And then they came back in 1954. In the intervening years, by the way, they had gone to uh, an we talk and had done testing over there. Again, part of the other testing that went on in the Pacific for which there are you know, continued legacies uh, from that. So we only had a day, we had basically half a day to try to map the, the Castle Bravos uh, area. So we knew we weren't gonna be able to fully map. We, didn't, we needed basically two days to, to map the whole thing. So, so we had to stretch out our lines why there's some little jagged artifacts here in the uh, in the gridding. Um, that left a crater that's more than 1,600 or more than 1,400 meters in diameter, with a max depth of 56 meters. And as soon as we were actually as we were out there mapping, it became very clear that it wasn't just one one uh, crater, but two. Uh, and some of these were reused. Uh, the large crater on the on the right in the eastern portion was from Castle Bravo, a 15 megaton, okay, so fully fully a thousand times more powerful approximately than the ones that were unleashed uh, in 46 and in 45. And um, then the Castle Romeo, which was a nine megaton hydrogen uh, bomb. And uh, as we were mowing the lawn, going back and forth, I remember at one point sort of nudging the, the rest of the team and and pointing up to the sky and saying, realizing that we were we were at that very moment in the middle of what had been that 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 mushroom cloud. Um, we did send some divers down, and they were actually able to get some 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 samples for us. And they said it, it just sort of looked like this lunar surface. It was just this powdery, carbonate, milky you know seabed because everything was just sort of uh, vaporized. And of course, a lot of it was thrown up into the atmosphere. And uh, some of the Bikinians who had left the island were living in nearby 180 to 100 miles away experienced in that day in 1954 two sunrises one in the east and then later that morning around 10 11 in the morning a sun that rose in the west that was the castle bravo uh, explosion and then about an hour later it started snowing and you had uh, bikinians running out kids not knowing thinking it was snow you know putting some of this in their in their mouth and getting exposed uh terribly to the uh, to the radiation form just for scale and this is by the way how the Defense Department sort of, you know, used to sort of, uh, you know, provide this for the folks back home. There's the Pentagon, and then I've overlaid uh, the Castle Bravo crater over over the Pentagon area, and then also outlined the, the diameter of the Baker crater. So for the for the for Mid Atlantic uh, chapter, this you know you can get a sense of sort of the scale uh, in, involved in these. So um, I know there's a lot more we could we could say and talk about uh, this. Um, I think for us the takeaway was there are still lasting legacies from the 23 atomic bombs that were tested in Bikini Atoll. Um, we 
I guess to call it first comprehensive, there's still a lot more of the mapping that we would have loved to have been able to do. We're hoping to try to get back there and the next time bring AUVs, ROVs, sub bottom profiles and other stuff because there's still a lot more to uh, to, to learn and know about what, what's happened there. And, and, and a lot more to trail still try to manage because like I said, we have several of these wrecks are continuing to uh, um, release uh, uh, high, you know hydrogen uh, uh, hydrocarbon fuel in, into the into the environment um, and uh, that still you know 73 now 75 years later there is still a heavy toll that has been ex exacted on the environment and uh, and on the humans uh, who live now in the shadow of uh, of that testing and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it right there well <laughs> absolutely fascinating art and start to finish that was a, that was excellent and um yeah you had me riveted um so i, I put it out there if anybody has some questions uh if you want to uh chat with art and find out if there's if, you know if you if you want to write your questions that's fine i or uh you can come on screen and do it that way too i i know i have a, a question which um what was the current radiation exposure in that area? Did you have to be aware of that while you were, I mean, your divers are down there and you've got, uh, you're handling equipment in the water? Yeah. Sure. I mean, that was that was certainly a, you know, a, a, a big concern um, for, from our team from, you know, as soon as any family members or stuff heard, oh, you're going to bikini, you know, what, what's, what's going to be going on? It was a major concern. Uh, from the production company, from from all the members of, of the team, and so we spent a, a fair bit of time, you know, uh, d discussing that. You know, there there um, um, there has been uh, a lot of dive activity there over the last decade or or two. In fact, um, so so active dive charters. If you know, if you ever uh, go in there, the conditions in the water are are actually um, quite fine. There are still high levels in the soil on the ground. Actually, the radiation levels on the surface. We're fine as well. We all carry dosimeters with us um, as a requirement for the production company and from the university. When the dosimeters came back and they analyzed those, they said um, we would have had more exposure to radiation walking around Midtown Manhattan than we did uh, there in Bikini. Um, the issue in the ground though, however, is there's still accumulations in the soil and those accumulate up into the roots and into the coconuts and then the coconut crabs eat those. So there's still, the, one of the reasons the bikinis can't return is because there's no longer they can't they, it's not reached the level where they can they can return to a subsistence uh, uh, lifestyle there um, in the marine environment one of the, it is in some ways it's an amazing testament to a marine protected area because in fact while you can say the impulse impacts of a nuclear uh, you know testing is immense it is it was a short period, you know, it was 23, you know, bombs, 46 to, to 58. The fact that there hasn't been human fishing development pressures in the intervening years has actually left the environment in many ways in, in, a, in a better, better condition. Trophics, the trophic uh, levels are all there, sharks, fish, corals. And in terms of the marine environment, it's made an amazing recovery and, and, and largely for the fact that humans haven't, haven't been there too much. Yeah, I mean, with the, uh, as you pointed out, the, the dive industries found that to be a, a, a fairly, it, you know, obviously it's an interesting spot. And uh, with respect to the radiation issue, obviously they wouldn't be letting people in there if it was right. too hot. No. But, but I think that's, you also mentioned the, you know, it's kind of the Chernobyl effect where, you know, they've, they've created this massive exclusion zone Yes. And now we can see what happens when human yep. interaction is, you know, yep. not part of the equation. Right. So that's yeah. In that's, fact, I think the production team was was really hoping. I mean, we we haven't visited some of the areas on uh, near around Castle Bravo. Some of the uh, remains of some of the structures still there, and they were, I think, desperately hoping to see some, you know, you know, response of the Geiger counter. And it was, it was under. Thankfully for us, it was underwhelming. Um, <laughs> Yeah, amazingly marginal. Yeah. Yeah, great. Well, I, I want to thank you again, Art, for, for kicking off the Mid-Atlantic um, uh, chapter's first session here with an excellent presentation. Um, now, I, I, I guess we'll 